In this lecture, we are going to look at the concept of interrupts and exceptions. Let's consider a motivating problem here. Consider a slow peripheral that has been attached to a CPU. An example of a slow peripheral in this case is the UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Let's consider that it's operating at a baud rate or a symbol rate of 9600 bits per second. Now, 9600 bits per second means that a byte, which is 8 bits, would take roughly about 1 millisecond to transfer. Maybe a little less than that, but close enough, 1 millisecond. Now, UARTs are commonly used as the serial console during boot up and in various other debugging applications for different kinds of processors. UARTs can be used as the target of printf statements, for example, and can be used to scan data for input to various functions. Now, the problem is one millisecond for a single byte of data, even a conservative or a slow CPU would typically operate at 100 megahertz range, which means that one millisecond is 100,000 clock cycles. What happens during this time? So for example, apart from the UART, we could also have other kinds of peripherals such as the keyboard, mouse, which typically have latencies in the order of milliseconds. What about disks in which large amounts of data are stored? They typically tend to have high initial latencies, which could easily be in the order of tens to hundreds of milliseconds even. On the other hand, they typically have high throughput, meaning that large amounts of data start coming through or the rate at which the data comes through is very large. So even though they have a high initial latency, after that latency, large amounts of data come through at a rapid rate. Video display, on the other hand, requires lots of data being copied back and forth between different frame buffers. The question in all of these cases is, should the CPU be waiting while each of these activities is going on? Because all of these are either just waiting for the peripheral to respond or waiting for some large amount of data to be transferred between two memory locations, which is not really useful computation from the point of view of the CPU. So what can be done about all of this? The alternative is let the UART take its own time, but once it has got data that is ready to be sent to the CPU, or on the other hand, once it has completed sending out a single byte that has been sent to it from the CPU, it can alert the CPU, somehow signal to the CPU that its job is done and it's ready for the next step. The question of course is how should this be done? This is where the idea of interrupts come in. These are external signals directly into the CPU core. What happens when a CPU gets such an external signal is it stops the current flow of execution and has to respond to the interrupt. Hence, of course, the name interrupt. And usually after completing the response to the interrupt, the CPU will return to where it was or what it was doing and continue the flow of execution. So this whole idea that you jump to a new location, execute some instructions out there and then come back to where you were, sounds very much like a function call. In this case, one that is pretty much created on demand, that is based on some other signal rather than an explicit function call which is present in the code. Now, this idea of interrupts, once we bring it in, can also be extended further. Why should we only respond to external hardware problems? What about internal problems? Examples of internal problems are unaligned memory accesses, invalid memory accesses, by which I mean access to a memory location that does not have a memory or peripheral mapped onto it. Problems such as a divide by zero operation inside an ALU, in the case where the ALU of course is capable of performing divisions or possibly even something as simple as an overflow from the ALU. How should it be treated? These are typically some kind of software errors or software problems. So rather than calling them interrupts, they are typically called exceptions. Based on this, we can broadly look at two different types of interrupts or exceptions. One are the asynchronous, which are usually called interrupts, these have an external source, they come from outside the CPU and are typically not related to the instruction currently being executed. The other type are the synchronous. Synchronous interrupts 
but usually called exceptions. Once again, over here, you could have two types. One type would be the ones that are detected by a processor. This would include memory faults, traps, hardware failures, such as, for example, trying to read from a peripheral that does not respond or that gives some kind of an error condition on return. The other could be some kind of programmed exceptions, meaning that it is actually a line of code or an assembly language instruction which generates an exception. Now, why would we ever do something of this sort? We might need to do something like this, for example, when we start considering protected execution. That is to say, when we have different privilege levels and a program that is running as a user needs to invoke some kind of a system call corresponding to an operating system. In general, in a multitasking system, the operating system has very tight control over which program gets to access which resource. And by resource, it could be either an input or output, it could be disk access, it could be network or various other systems that the operating system is in charge of. Now, in order to perform this control in a reasonable manner, there has to be some way by which the user can also request access to these. And this is typically done by effectively creating some kind of an exception that allows the user to ask the operating system to perform some work on their behalf and give back the result. This is not typically a normal instruction as part of the assembly language. It is some kind of a privileged instruction, which is usually treated similar to an exception. An example of what, of how we could go about connecting interrupts in the case of the microblaze processor that we saw earlier, we would now have one new peripheral out here, which is typically labeled INTC, the interrupt controller. And what you can see over here is the different devices, the UART, the timer, and in our case, the TFT controller, all of them have these signals that are pooled together using some kind of wire concatenation. And that signal is then provided to the interrupt controller. Now the interrupt controller in turn sends one signal, which is the actual interrupt to the CPU itself. The CPU in other words, does not directly need to know about the individual peripherals, the UART, the timer and so on just like we had the arbiter taking care of the address maps, the interrupt controller collects all the interrupt signals together and sends a single signal to the CPU so that the CPU can operate in a more streamlined manner. The address map for the interrupt controller would just be like any other typical AXI device. What happens in this case is that the interrupt controller itself can be thought of as a peripheral that can be programmed by telling it how it should respond when different kinds of interrupts are received. Which of course leads us to the next problem. How in general should interrupts be handled? One common approach is to use something called vectored addressing. What happens over here is that you have some kind of a lookup table or an array of addresses. And the interrupt controller's job is to assign some kind of a number to each interrupt. How the numbers are assigned could just be based on how the wires are concatenated together or it could be some other logic which is programmed into it by the CPU. But this definitely requires some knowledge of how the hardware has been put together. But once you have assigned numbers in this way, what it means is that inside the CPU, as and when an interrupt occurs, the CPU can take this number as an input and calculate a target address to jump to. In terms of what actually happens inside the CPU, what needs to be done is we realize that we are essentially performing a jump operation, something like a function call, which means that some context of the function or the code presently being operated upon needs to be saved. Typically, we would need to save the registers, the present address where we are, and then we can perform something like a jump and link which basically says, okay, store the present address in some register and go to this new address corresponding to the interrupt handler. One thing that can be done 
is that you may decide that under certain circumstances you do not want to respond to certain interrupts for example while you are updating the screen you may not want to get interrupted by the uart peripheral in which case you can disable it and typically this can be done directly by programming the interrupt controller the cpu just needs to appropriately set some registers inside the interrupt controller in order to prevent it from directly responding to certain kinds of interrupts typically this is a bad idea to leave it this way for a long time essentially because it effect effectively means that you have lost that interrupt you do not that per particular per peripheral does not have any way of waking up the cpu or getting it to respond communication systems for example could break down and in the worst case you might even lose control over the entire system if all interrupts are disabled and there is no other way to get the cpu's attention this is where typically there is one interrupt which is brought into every cpu which is usually called the non maskable interrupt this is something which cannot be masked out in software it cannot be stopped in software it will always cause the cpu to respond now you could of course change things around and say that the response itself is something which is going to be perhaps not doing very much but it is guaranteed that the non maskable interrupt will at least be seen by the cpu now you are all probably familiar with the control alt delete sequence of keys that are used in most at least windows based windows and linux based pcs typically in order to wake up the system in some cases also to just create a log on screen but the important thing is this actually was related to the idea of the non maskable interrupt this was the first kind of non maskable interrupt that was implemented in ibm computers and was used precisely for that in the worst case if the software sent the system into a loop that it couldn't get out of the control alt delete sequence could be used to effectively break out of any problem that the system had usually by rebooting the system but sometimes also it could catch that interrupt and redirect it to some safe mode where the present program would just be killed now all this also leads us to an interesting thought on how to handle interrupts and the important point to observe over here is that we should try and keep the interrupt handling itself as brief as possible the reason for this of course is that interrupts can happen at any time by their very nature they are asynchronous they can come in from outside the cpu and if you are going to take a long time handling one interrupt there is nothing preventing another interrupt from coming along but on the other hand what if you have an interrupt that is basically coming from a network controller and telling you to transfer several megabytes of data into the cpu memory now usually what happens in such a case is that we break up the interrupt handling into two parts one of them will just handle the main interrupt it will acknowledge to the network controller that yes the operating system is now aware that you have data to be transferred and immediately after that return control back to whatever was running before that if you don't do this during the entire time that perhaps megabytes of data are being transferred the system will effectively freeze you will not even be able to move the mouse or type anything on the keyboard but by keeping the interrupt handling very brief you return control to the normal logic but what happens after that is that an event is generated which needs to be processed by the operating system so the operating system needs to keep track of all such events and process them as and when it is able to this also means that we might have to deal with a problem known as nested interrupts it can be handled but has to be handled with extreme care because interrupts are typically an indication that something has gone out of the ordinary even if it is something as simple as a uh, peripheral just indicating that it has data ready for reading this has broken the flow of the cpu and if we now have nested interrupts that is to say while we are handling one interrupt we try to process another one we could easily end up in a situation where we lose track of where we are in the overall system and can lead to crashing the entire computer 